To date, all spacecraft sent into deep space are on scientific data gathering primary missions. There are no primary military missions or even normal civilian service missions such as communication and navigation. Whenever a spacecraft is sent to a partially unknown environment, the safest missions to conduct are the ones that are not dependent on the environment or any infrastructure. Due to the very strict volume and weight limitations at launch, smaller instruments that are less advanced than their earthbound counterparts are placed on these spacecraft. But what if we can use an advanced instrument that's earthbound to directly gather data from deep space as if it was located on the spacecraft? That would open up a whole new world for investigation and discoveries. The radio science technique makes this possible, and most spacecraft in deep space utilize this technique today. Saturn is the most distinct planet in the solar system, made so by its ring system. They are the only planetary rings discovered visually from Earth instead of a spacecraft in deep space. These Cassini videos were created by fellow YouTuber Astroflask by processing the raw images provided by NASA. Check out the Astroflask channel for more images from spacecraft turned into awesome videos. Link is in the description. Now, the interaction between the rings of Saturn and its many moons is something that always intrigued scientists. It was known since the late 1800s that Saturn's rings were not solid, but instead made of small particles. But determining the size of these particles with a camera is not easy, even if it's mounted on an orbiting spacecraft. They are too small when viewed at a safe distance and move too fast and are potentially dangerous when viewed close up. Radio science makes it possible to determine the size of these particles from a safe distance. The matter of fact, radio science has been used to measure mass, atmospheric temperature and pressure of the moons in the Saturn system. Radio science specifically on the Cassini spacecraft was even used to search for gravitational waves between 2001 and 2004 while en route to Saturn. However, gravitational waves would not be detected until 2015 by the LIGO detectors. But how does radio science manage to measure all these dissimilar parameters? The first thing to note that radio science is not an actual device that detects anything. Instead, it relies on the normal communication channel between spacecraft and Earth. Radio science at its core is the study of physical objects and phenomena using radio waves. Communication with the spacecraft in deep space happens at a frequency between 2 to 40 gigahertz. These frequencies are known as the S, X, and Ka bands. There are two main ways to conduct radio science. One is propagation distortion, the other is gravitational influence. In propagation distortion, the waves travel through space and interact with objects in their path. They can be reflected, refracted, absorbed, and scattered by a celestial object, be it a planet, moon, atmosphere, or even dust cloud. As a result of these interactions, the reception time, amplitude, frequency, polarization, phase, and dispersions of the signal received will be changed. By comparing the received signal against what's expected if nothing was in the path of the wave, and in conjunction with known facts about the spacecraft's environment, the ground station can infer certain properties about the objects that are causing the interference. The Cassini-Huygens mission was a mission where radio science was heavily used. So, for the rest of this video, I'll be specifically referring to the radio science as performed by Cassini. Now, the other way to conduct radio science is by gravitational influence. Gravitational influence works by detecting shift in the transmission frequency caused by the change in radial velocity of the spacecraft relative to Earth. This is known as the Doppler shift, 
Since Newton's first law of motion states that an object will not change its velocity unless acted by an outside unbalanced force, any unexpected change in the velocity of the spacecraft can be attributed to gravitational influence which can then be used to calculate the mass of nearby planets and moons. And based on images, radio altimeter, and a planetary shape model, the volume of a moon can be determined. Combining the volume with the mass, the density of the object can be computed. Finally, by using the density and planetary models, the basic composition of the object can be inferred. This is all based on the unexpected Doppler shift in transmission frequency, which itself is based on the unexpected motion of the spacecraft. As straightforward as this technique sounds, it's way more complicated to compute the actual planetary gravitational force acting on the spacecraft. And that's because a spacecraft anywhere in the solar system will respond to any and every force acting on it. And there are lots of forces acting on it. I'll list most of them here and give a short explanation if the name itself is not self-explanatory. Some forces may be negligible based on the distance to the source. So, number one, point mass Newtonian gravitational acceleration due to the sun, planets, and their satellites, as well as asteroids and comets. Two, accelerations caused by tidal effect on the physical central body. Number three, Acceleration due to time-varying gravity effects such as atmospheric or ice movement. Number four, gravitational acceleration due to planetary rings. Five, gravitational acceleration due to mass cons. Mass con is short for mass concentration and is the concentration of matter under the surface of a celestial object. Six, solar radiation pressure. Seven, planetary radiation pressure acceleration due to radiation emitted from the surface of a planet, such as reflected visible light and thermal radiation. 8. Thermal imbalance, acceleration due to non-uniform spacecraft surface heating. 9. Gas leakage, acceleration due to spacecraft controlled jet leakage. Number 10. Atmospheric drag. And finally, number 11. Command maneuvers all these forces must be modeled properly from the Doppler shift data, the various planetary models, and the current environment the spacecraft finds itself in. Only then can the individual forces be used in other calculations with confidence. One of the accelerations noted in the list was the gravitational acceleration due to planetary rings. Cassini used this to confirm the composition of Saturn's rings via density computation after the size of the particles were computed from analyzing the propagation distortion of the radio science transmission. Sending radio transmission through a ring or atmosphere can yield a lot of useful information. Let's start with how we can compute the size of particles in a planetary ring. Cassini first aligns its high gain antenna towards Earth in such a way that a transmission from the spacecraft must first go through a portion of Saturn's rings that's under investigation. Cassini then transmitted a signal at three different frequencies ranging from 2 GHz to 40 GHz. Multiple frequencies are used because they interact differently based on the size of the particles they encounter. This is similar to the way high frequency colors are scattered more in Earth's atmosphere, making the sky look blue. As the waves from Cassini hit the particles in the ring, some are diffracted and scattered, while most will go through. Of the waves that are scattered, which are now out of phase with the original signal, a small amount will be scattered towards Earth along with the original signal. These two signals are then received on Earth by the deep space network as a single signal. From the interference pattern in the signal, the scattered signal can be separated from the original. Further processing of the scattered signal based on its intensity, phase, frequency shift relative to the original signal will yield information about the diffraction caused by the particles in Saturn's rings. This information combined with various planetary ring models will then put a size limit on the particles that are expected to be in these rings. But planetary rings are not the only structure we can analyze using radio science. Radio science can be used to extract temperature and pressure information. 
This technique was used way before Cassini on the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1980 when it flew by Saturn and Titan. When probing the atmosphere of a planet or moon using radio signs, a spacecraft will start transmitting a signal towards Earth in such a way that the beam is tangent to the atmosphere. As the spacecraft moves on its planned trajectory, the beam will move deeper into the atmosphere, causing it to bend or refract as it heads towards Earth. This refraction is too small to be measured directly on Earth because of the combination of distance and signal dispersion. However, the angle can be inferred if we take into consideration the Doppler shift that the refraction causes in the signal. Doppler shift and by extension redshift is caused by the radial velocity between source and receiver. The radial velocity is the component of the source velocity that points in the direction of the receiver. So, if a source is heading directly at a receiver, its radial velocity will be the same as its actual velocity. As it starts to move away from a head-on direction, its radial velocity will start to get lower than its actual velocity until it's moving perpendicular to the receiver. At this time, its radial velocity will be zero. So given this fact, as the atmosphere bends the transmission, there will be Doppler shift in the transmission when it's received on Earth. This Doppler shift can then be applied to an atmospheric refraction model to compute the refractive index of the gas the transmission went through. With the refractive index, we can then compute the temperature pressure profile of the gas because the refractive index of a gas is dependent on both temperature and pressure. As the transmission beam cuts deeper into the atmosphere, we're able to get temperature and pressure data at various altitude in the atmosphere. This method of obtaining pressure and temperature data is not as accurate as other more direct methods that measure the radiant heat emitted by the atmosphere. And this is usually the trade-off between remote sensing instruments that produce useful information through inference from the data or in situ instruments that measure the phenomenon directly by interacting with it. However, the more accurate in situ instruments cannot be deployed in environments that are hostile to the instruments, inaccessible, or located too far. In environments like these, remote sensing may be the only option. The radio science experiments conducted by the Deep Space Network and Cassini shortly after its launch in 1997 till its demise in 2017 gave us a wealth of information about the Saturn system that would not have been possible otherwise. For every pretty picture and video we see of space, there are many times more useful non-visual data that's collected. But it's these pretty pictures that captures the collective imagination of humanity. And it's these pictures and videos that makes humanity want to explore space even more. Check out the Astroflats channel for more of these awe-inspiring videos. I'm DexDFX for Sensing the Universe.